Thank you very much, Professor Grasso. I'd like to thank uh, the organising committee of ECR for inviting me to speak today. It's a great honour to speak with uh, such uh, eminent speakers in the field of gastrointestinal imaging. So um, my talk today um, will focus on what the surgeon does, surgical procedures and normal post-operative anatomy. And the learning outcomes will be to discuss common surgical procedures performed in the esophagus, stomach, small bowel and colon and to appreciate the normal appearances of an intestinal anastomosis on fluoroscopic and cross-sectional imaging, and finally, to understand the normal appearances of hemostatic packing and other surgical devices on imaging. So imaging of the post-operative abdomen, as Professor Grasso said, uh, poses numerous pitfalls for the interpreting radiologist. It is our role to try and differentiate an anastomotic leak versus a complex or unconventional anastomosis or reconstruction, to try and differentiate ileus versus small bound obstruction. This can be difficult. To, di to differentiate an acceptable amount of post-operative fluid or air versus a collection or abscess, and again, this can be difficult. And also, to differentiate unlabeled bowel versus collection or abscess. Also, there are new challenges which we have to face, such as finding and, and identifying surgical materials left behind intentionally by, by the, the surgeon surgical packing and hemostatic compounds. Now, here's an ex example of a case which posed some challenge to us. A patient who was post-operative and had a fever with an elevated white cell count, and we wondered about an abscess. And uh, when we did the initial scan, we could see here that there is something here anteriorly in the pelvis. We weren't sure was this an abscess or whatever. But what we did is we brought the patient back, and an hour later, the contrast had moved on, and more small bowel loops were filled. So clearly, this was not a collection. It was an unlabeled bowel. And, and clearly that would have had a major impact on management. I just want to briefly talk about fluoroscopy postoperatively. And in this situation, fluoroscopy still has a very important role. It provides real-time functional assessment. It can be limited by the patient's condition. Patients have difficulty moving. And also they have difficulty uh, drinking oral contrast. I think it's very important that the radiologist is aware of drains. We must not pull them out. So you have to be careful of those drains from the time the person enters the fluoroscopic room. Be aware that the drains may cause um, the presence of intraperitoneal free air. Now, choosing contrast, we usually use water-soluble contrast and preferably non-ionic contrast. Gastrographin, as you know, can, can induce uh, a significant chemical pneumonitis. Uh, we don't use barium much because we don't want barium spillage. Barium isn't easily reabsorbed, and it can cause artifact in the mediastinum or peritoneum on CT for many years. Water-soluble contrast has an advantage in this setting because it can be therapeutic for ileus or other um, small bowel problems. Now, this is a case who came into us at uh, the Cork University Hospital, and uh, it was a peculiar uh, case. There was increased density surrounding the spleen, the liver, and the small bowel in the left lower quadrant. We were a bit perplexed by this, so we went back to the medical records, and there was a remote history of perforated uh, sigmoid diverticulitis, and the patient had a barium enema at the time. So this is barium peritonitis, which had existed for many years afterwards. Now, I'd like to move on to the esophagus. And esophageal surgery, as we all know, may be associated with significant morbidity and mortality. And one of the key things is that we must be aware and have a detailed understanding of the surgical resection and the GI reconstruction that the surgeon has done. Contrast studies are typically performed at 5 to 10 days, prior to beginning oral intake or removing nasogastric tube or drains. Now, one of the key things for the radiologist is we must distend the esophagus or else we're going to miss leaks. And it's also, impo it's also very, very important to assess GI transit beyond the anastomosis. These patients are prone to ileus and these patients are prone to delayed gastric entering, emptying. Uh, Non-ionic contrast um, is usually used, but sometimes we follow this with barium to get better definition. And some surgeons like us giving barium. Now, I'm going to move through some of the common surgical procedures. Uh, firstly, the Ivor Lewis procedure is a common procedure formed, uh, performed. It's a two-stage procedure for mid-esophageal mid tumors. The first stage of the procedure is a, a midline laparotomy and then a right thoracotomy. So the, the laparotomy is performed to mobilize the lower esophagus and stomach. The duodenum is mobilized, and then a lymphadenectomy is performed if necessary. Then a right-sided thoracotomy is performed, the esophagus is mobilized, lymphadenectomy and the mediastinum is performed, and then you perform your esophagectomy with a wide margin. A gastric tube is made, and the anastomosis occurs at the level of the aortic arch. So this is what we see on barium. This is the native esophagus. This is the anastomosis. This is the gastric tube, which we've formed, and a very nice result without evidence of a leak.
Now, there are modifications of that, including the three-stage esophagectomy or the lewis McKeown procedure. Now, really what that is is just the same procedure, but with the, an added incision in the neck. And why do we do that? Because the surgeon wants to resect the esophagus more cranially. Um, and also, you get a more extensive lymph lymphadenectomy with that procedure. Um, so basically, on imaging, you may find the suture line in the neck, but the key thing is that the anastomosis is higher uh, up at the level of the neck. The transhiatal esophagectomy, we're all um, very aware of this. A thoracotomy is avoided, so that's a major advantage for patients with poor respiratory reserve and early stage disease. So you have two incisions. You have a neck incision and an abdominal incision. In the abdominal incision, you mobilize the stomach, the esophagus, the distal thoracic esophagus, and then the second dissection in the neck, you dissect downwards, and you uh, dissect the esophagus from above. Um, the esophagogastric anastomosis is performed in the neck, um, and the, the tube is delivered through the posterior mediastinum, as we see here. Now, one of the problems with, with the transhiatal esophagectomy compared to the other procedures is that extensive lymphadenectomy is less uh, feasible. And the problem with that, of course, is that if you have extensive disease, you shouldn't be doing this procedure. Now, the left thoracoabdominal approach is a less common procedure. So in this case, you only have one incision, a left thoracotomy through the sixth or seventh intercostal space. It's usually done for lower esophageal tumors. Very similar in every other way, a gastric tube is formed following esophagectomy, and the anastomosis is formed at the level of the uh, aortic arch. Now, esophageal bypass, these are interesting procedures, and sometimes usually performed with esophagectomy, but can be performed with advanced disease uh, without esophageal resection. The conduits are usually made up of colon, as we have in this case, or jejunum, myocutaneous or fasciocutaneous flaps. The course of the conduit is variable. It can be substernal, it can be presternal, or posterior mediastinal in position. Substernal is the most common. Now, the key thing with these procedures is when complications occur, always remember there's been a lot of work and a lot of anastomosis beneath the diaphragm, so you have to be aware that you must also image the abdomen. So these are some examples of these seen on CT. This is a substernal colonic conduit, and these are two posterior mediastinal colonic conduits. Now, how do they look on imaging? This is a colonic conduit. High up in, high up in the neck, you have the anastomosis, and you have the normal haustrations. And here is a jejunal conduit with the normal valvulae conoventes. Now, I'll move on to more procedures for more benign conditions. Heller's myotomy, that's an interesting uh, procedure done for uh, severe cases of achalasia. Laparoscopic Heller's is now the most common procedure done. What the surgeon does, they cut the serosa, then they dissect the circular muscle, and then by the end of the procedure, the mucosa is pouting out very nicely through the incision. And one of the problems with this, when you disturb a circular muscle, uh, you, may get, you may predispose the patient to uh, gastro, sorry, gastroesophageal reflux, and this is a low incidence of complications. Heller's myotomy, this is a very nice result with a Heller's myotomy here, very nice flow and no residual achalasia, and this is what you don't want to see, a small leak. I just want to move on to the stomach. There's been a lot of change in the last 10 to 15 years in gastric surgery. The range and subtypes of procedures performed have changed. There are changes in the incidence and location of gastric cancer, and there's more widespread acceptance of bariatric surgery. So Nissen's fund application now is very commonly performed um, uh, it's very commonly performed uh, laparoscopically. And basically what you do is a wrap is formed where the fundus is, is mobilized and uh, the wrap is made anteriorly there, like there, the suture line is performed there. And this is what you see in the post-operative imaging. Very nice example. And this causes augmentation and narrowing at the level of the gastroesophageal junction. This is another case of a fundal application which we had. Again, the wrap is formed anteriorly and uh, you can see that there's augmentation of the lower esophageal sphincter. This is what it looks like on a CT scan, and you have a little leak here going back with a collection of barium in the left floor space. I would like to move on to gastric resections. The Billroth 1 procedure is an old procedure, not performed very often. What you have is you have a distal uh, gastric resection, and then you have anastomosis of the duodenum to the distal stomach. That's the Billroth 1. The Billroth 2 is very similar, except that you have a gastrogegenostomy, which, um, which uh, restores the continuity of the, of the gastrointestinal tract. Now, you do have a duodenal stump here, and it's important to remember that. Duodenal stumps can leak, and in that case, you need to, you need to perform CT scan uh, for further evaluation. Now, subtotal gastrectomy with Ruan Y reconstruction. This is a similar procedure. Again, the stomach is resected, 
and the continuity of the G GI tract is restored via a, a Roux and Y uh, reconstruction. Now, total gastrectomy is usually for malignancy. The whole stomach is, is resected, and you do a lymphadenectomy if necessary. Again, you have a duodenal stump, and that's important. Um, a Roux loop is brought up, as we have here, and anastomosis of the distal esophagus. The jejunal jejunal anastomosis is usually 50 to 60 centimetres from the esophago jejunal anastomosis. Now, one of the key things for the radiologist here, when we're performing these procedures, we must get the stension and we must move the patient into several positions because you have to fill afferent loops and efferent loops, loops etc., and you won't be able to do that uh, unless you move the patient and get good distension. And the other key point, I think, when you're looking at these procedures, if you're worried about, du about a duodenal stump leak, you must do a CT scan. It's very difficult to diagnose this with barium studies. I want to move on briefly to um, bariatric surgery. And the two main types of bariatric surgery that we come across in practice are the restrictive uh, type of surgery, which is the most common, but then there are also more complex combined restrictive and malabsorptive types of surgery. Now, the first type of restrictive surgery that, that, that you'll see is the vertical banded gastropexy, where a suture line, usually with a GI stapler, is made down along the, the stomach. It's parallel with the lesser curve of the stomach. So you create a very na narrow gastric tube with a silicone band at the lower end. The silicone band is to cause further restriction. So on barium, this is what you see. This is the, this is the suture line here with the GIA stapler. This is the, the, the narrow tube. And you can see the silicone band is causing some, re some restriction. And this is the excluded stomach, which... Um, which uh, regains its continuity with the stomach at the level of the gastric antrum. Sleeve gastrectomy, similar principle. You form a very na narrow tube, but this time you resect the excluded stomach. So this is what it looks like, a very narrow stomach with duodenum beyond it. Now, what we see more and more in our practice in Cork are patients coming back after laparoscopic adjustable band surgery. And what that is, a laparoscopic procedure where a prosthetic device is placed uh, in the proximal stomach just beyond the gastroesophageal junction, and there's a little pouch created above it. So the synthetic band there is joined then by a plastic tubing to a little port in the anterior abdominal wall, which allows us to adjust uh, this uh, device and cause greater or lesser degrees of constriction. So this is what we see on our, our imaging. This is the port. This is the tubing. In this case, we've injected some contrast to make sure that the synthetic band is still intact, and when we do barium studies, this is the esophagus, the stomach, this is the little pouch, and then you can see the restrictive band uh, inferiorly. A case we had recently in Cork, a patient who had, uh, uh, had a laparoscopic um, procedure done, and you can see this is the band here, but the patient couldn't swallow anymore, had severe dysphagia from this. And you can see when we did the barium, we couldn't get the contrast by it. And then, of course, we had to adjust it under fluoroscopic guidance, and uh, we got good uh, flow of contrast into the stomach. Now, the combined restrictive and malabsorptive procedures are very, very interesting, very, very complex, and I won't have time to go through them in detail. The principles of it is that you have a restrictive procedure, a very narrow gastric tube, as you have here, um, a sleeve gastrectomy, which you have here, and then you, you also have a roux en y um, bypass, and that the comparative lengths of the roux en y reconstruction determines the degree of the malabsorptive effect. So the lack of biliary and other enzymes um, for the majority of the flow um, causes a malabsorptive effect. Now I'd like to move on to the small bowel and colon. Now the small bowel is different to the upper GI tract in that we do contrast studies less frequently to assess for anastomotic leaks. CT and MRI are much more useful in this situation. Um, imaging is also performed to distinguish ileus from obstruction. That can be a very difficult distinction. CT is best for distinguishing complex and sorry, complicated and uncomplicated cases of small bowel obstruction. Serial plane radiographs still have a role. And uh, Dr. Dermot Malone and, and, and Mary Staunton from Dublin uh, did a, an evidence-based review and concluded that a modified, um, modified water-soluble follow-through can be very effective in this setting. If you give 100 mils of gastrographin orally and you perform a PFA at four hours, if the, if the contrast doesn't reach the right colon within four hours, it's very suggestive of small bowel obstruction. So just to show you some cases here, patient here following small bowel obstruction, there's a suture line here in the right lower quadrant, a patient here with a stoma. And one of the key features here, I think, is that the, bowel, the small bowel is regularly, doesn't really return to normal after these procedures. Many of them have Crohn's disease, as we have here. And you can see there's a lot of small bowel thickening. 
And it always looks abnormal, but the key thing is we have to look for obstruction, we have to look for fistula, and we have to look for, for abnormal fluid collections. The other thing is we're always looking for how well the stoma is working, as we see here. Now, this is a case where CT helped uh, with, a, with a complicated cause of small bowel obstruction. Patient postoperatively developed severe pain, had this loop of bowel in the right upper quadrant. We were very concerned about the patient clinically, brought the patient to, um, the, op- brought the patient to the CT scanner, and we could clearly see the same loop there's a small bowel feces sign suggesting obstruction, and at the base of this, there's a, there's a twist. Uh, at the base of the small bowel mesentery, there's lack of enhancement. So this patient, we thought, had ischemic, um, had ischemic uh, small bowel due to, a, due to a twist or an internal hernia, and uh, you can see this is what the surgeons found. Now, I'd just like to finish with ilioanal um, anastomosis. This is performed following panproctocolectomy. It can be performed as a single, two-stage, or three-stage procedure. The most common pouch is the J pouch, but you can see S pouches and W pouches. Fluoroscopy in these patients is usually performed at two to three months. And one of the key things you must do is do a good plain film beforehand to identify where the staple lines are. You can see them here uh, so that you know what you're dealing with when you do the the study. Now, these are some fluoroscopy studies uh, on our patients. Uh, Here's a, a, a J pouch. Now, one thing you must look out for is this long J pouch appendage. If you don't appreciate that, you may think that the anastomo or the, 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 the J pouch suture line has been affected or, or disrupted. The other thing, you could mistake this for a leak. Here's a very nice case, uh, very nice case, J pouch, uh, nice volume. It looks absolutely like a, a rectum on the lateral view, so it's very impressive. CT can be very good for looking at the suture lines. We can see the suture lines very clearly here. And increasingly, we're using Cine uh, MRI for looking at the function of these pouches and also for looking for any problems with the proximal anastomosis. Now, the final surgical procedure I want to talk about are colectomy and various uh, colonic resections. And we usually perform contrast enemas in these patients um, following surgery. Um, again, a control film is a good idea before you do the procedure. Anastomotic leaks, you have to be very, very careful when you're trying to diagnose these. You must do three plane views. A lot of these leaks are seen posteriorly, so you need a good lateral view. And uh, this is typical examples here of a right hemicolectomy with a suture line. Uh, another one here on a nice coronal CT. And this is a contrast enema, and you can see the anastomosis here very, very nicely. Another case here. Now, you have to be careful of the enticide anastomosis. You can see an enticide anastomosis. If you're not aware of that, you can mistake that for a leak. And this is how they look like on a CT scan, a nice coronal reconstruction, and then an axial view. It can be quite clear. So if you're not clear, call the surgeon, and, and they, will, they will put you straight, hopefully. Um, now, other... Um, Contrast enemas postoperatively. This case we did, and we wondered, could there be a stricture? In that situation, we gave some boscoban, and we can see it's clearly open. So it's worthwhile really looking at these carefully. And this is a case where we did a, a, a low anterior resection, a contrast enema, and there was this little outpouching here. We worried, was that a leak? But we turned the patient 360 degrees, gave a little bit of boscoban, and you can see here that this was an enticide anastomosis. I want to, for the last two or three minutes, I just want to talk about surgical materials left behind. Now, these can confound us and make our lives difficult when we're reading these cases. Surgical cell is one of the, the things that we need to be aware of. Um, it's usually a low mass, uh, sorry, a low attenuation mass in CT. Usually there's air interdigitating between it. And it can look like an abscess. And uh, it, it's very, very difficult sometimes. One of the key things is that it usually doesn't enhance, and the wall of it doesn't enhance, whereas an abscess usually does. Um, also on MR, uh, surgery cell is hypointense on T2-weighted imaging compared to abscesses, which are nearly always um, T2 hyperintense. Now, this is a case from Damien Tolan, again, a very nice case in the pelvis uh, with uh, surgery cell. Again, there's no enhancement in the wall, but you can see the air. And another case from Damien in the left periortic region, again, a very nice uh, example of, of surgery cell. This is just... Um, a case from uh, Dr. Owen O'Connor, my, my colleague in Cork, and uh, this is a new material which has been used by radiotherapists to display structures away when they're giving radiotherapy, a substance called alloderm. This is a patient with, with, um, with cholangiocarcinoma, and they put this to, in the abdomen to displace uh, the duodenum. You can see it here again. Now, if you weren't aware of that, I think you'd easily mistake this uh, for a current tumor. So I think we need to be careful. We need to call the, the, the surgeons and see what the story is. The last thing is the imaging of meshes, the majority are polypropylene or polyfluoroethylene. There's sometimes, um, sometimes you can only see the metallic studs, as we can see here, but sometimes you can see the whole mesh and the studs. And sometimes it's a little bit more difficult to see the mesh. This patient developed a hematoma following the procedure. 
The last thing is just procedures that radiologists uh, leave behind and can cause confounders. I mean, this patient has not been shot. He's just been attacked by an interventional radiologist who's put coils in there for, for some bleeding. And the other thing is dropped gallstones. This case, we were worried for a while the patient had peritoneal carcinomatosis. It's not. It's a dropped gallstone. So in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, there's no question that imaging of the postoperative abdomen is very challenging. Uh, I think the key thing is that we must know about the surgical resection. We must know what the surgeon has done to the patient uh, to avoid misinterpreting these cases. It's very important, I think, to be a, that radiologists doing this are comfortable with barium and fluoroscopic procedures, and we correlate the information from both to make a, an appropriate interpretation of the patient's case. When you see peculiar things, consider foreign body or surgery cell, and it's important to try and differentiate those. And I think the key take-home message is we should never treat an image. We should discuss the case with the surgeon and correlate with clinical findings before a major decision is made. Thank you very much.